morning uh, and welcome, Ted. Thank you, Mel. Ted Vining is, is one of the most dramatic and soulful drummers that we've ever seen in this country, in the jazz scene, and it's a great honour to be talking to him about his life in music, so welcome, Ted. Good to be here, mate. Yeah, it's good. Now, um, when I was doing some preparation for uh, um, some background research, it, it was just fascinating that the, the things that you've done in your life. So we're going to try and cover as much as we can. So how did you, how did you get interested in jazz? Um, it all stemmed, my brother was a, a, a dance band drummer who preferred tinkering with cars. And when I was about 10 years old, he gave me his drums because he went and we got serious about being a mechanic. So, uh, and I used to listen to the hit parade in those days, which was Bing Crosby, Rosemary Clooney, Frank Sinatra, good music, you know. Yep. And I played along with it, with my brother's drums. And, and uh, then I heard, of all things, Frank Johnson's fabulous Dixielanders on the radio, and, and that turned me around, yeah. yeah. So that was, that, that was really the, the start of your interest in jazz. Yeah. Were there, were there any other um, uh, musical people in your family? No, not at all, no. Just my brother and I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was the one that annoyed the neighbours most, though. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you get your first, the, the drum kit came from your brother? Yes, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. So, um, when, you, when you got started in, in, in with it, uh, you were playing drums, we're talking about the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So tell us how, how you got, did you have any lessons? No, uh, I was self-taught, um, just from listening to drummers on records. But I went to what is a very famous jam session that happened at the Chicken Farm in Hyatt, where just about every jazz musician in Melbourne attended over Easter. It started on Good Friday, finished on Monday night, yeah, this jam session. So I. I got to play and jam with all sorts of people that I'd never met before, and, and that's the way you got recognised. If they thought you were a good player, you might get a phone call next week and get a gig, you know, so that's how it started, really. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So all this time uh, that you, you were doing that, this wasn't, you didn't see yourself as a, in a musical career, you were... Oh, no, certainly not, no. I, no, I mean, we, everybody has dreams of that, but it's it's economically unviable, actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what what sort of work were you involved with during your your? Yeah, I, I, I first went into into um, newspaper publishing. I worked for Rupert Murdoch for about twenty five years of my life, um, uh, in mostly in advertising and marketing. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Okay. And all this time you were you were just building up. Your, your I did have some formal lessons with uh, um, Harold Ripper at the time for a little while, and with Graham Morgan, and we he, and with of all things, uh, Billy Hyde's son Gary. Billy came to me and asked me to teach Gary to to, to play jazz. Right and at the same time, Gary taught me how to read music. So it, it was, the response was great. Yeah. So. Right, so that yeah. was that was the uh, the basis of it. Yeah. So, um, how long after you you started self-taught did you you started having those lessons? Um, probably a couple of years, even. Yeah, it was. Right. Yeah, to, to just I mean, I, because I I've got very good ears and I could understand um, the rudiments of it all, but I never knew what they were actually called or what stickings you had to use until. That's what helped me when I had lessons. I, that showed me what I was doing. Yes. And mostly I was doing it right, which was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you were just a, a bit of a natural yeah, at it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so uh, it's really good. Ted, I understand that you uh, played in the late 50s with the uh, Channel 7's Cool Cat show. Tell yeah. us a, yeah. what, 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 what sort of show was it? It was a, a pop music show where kids came in and listened to a, D, a disc jockey playing Elvis Presley and Bill Haley in the comments and all these kids used to dance around to it. But but I had a trio on there that we used to play um, two jazz pieces on every program, which was wonderful because Don Bennett's the host was into jazz. He liked it and it was just it lasted for about two years. Yeah. Okay. So who were the musicians? Um, it started with a blind piano player named John Doyle, who is no longer with us. And David Tolley, who's no longer with us on the bass, um, 
it got to uh, Don Wilde on the piano, who's no longer with us, John Adams on the piano, who's no longer with us, Barry Buckley on the bass, who's no longer <laughs> I'm the only one left. <laughs> the last man standing. Uh, that's really good. So that, that was a time when um, we just the changeover where rock and roll was about to take over the world. Yeah, it was big, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, it, it got to the stage where um, I used to do things on television like Breaker and Elvis Presley, Presley record on the desk and then I'd walk down the street sometime and a car would pull up saying, don't you ever break another Elvis Presley record. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the 1960s was an interesting time when you were, um, you were spending your time at a, a bit of Club 44. Yeah, yeah. With so, uh, Horst Leopold? Yeah, Jazz Centre 44, yeah. And I mean, there, I mean, there were so many places to play in those days, it was great. I, I played every Friday night and every Saturday night with the Frank Cow Jazz Band at, at uh, that church, Christ Church on the corner of Punt Road and Turek Road. Yes. And then Saturday night was in Mooney Ponds, at the, called the U Club, with, with all the, Bob Bernard was in the band, Harry Price, Alan Lee, was yeah. Great band, good fun. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but COP44 was probably where you first started, you know, pushing the, the envelope. New thing with Jazz, Jazz Centre 44, yeah, because yeah. I, I used to go there and listen to the original Brian Brown Quintet with my very favourite drummer named Stuart Spear. Yeah. Yes. Um, I used to go there and listen to that band until one day I met Alan Lee and uh, we got together and we started playing there, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, so that was a bit, and um, Keith Hounslow. Was, oh, Keith too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was, well, that was, must have been some some wonderful times there. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Keith was one of my favourite musicians. Yeah, mm, yeah. And uh, then I suppose the um, the big thing of that era was the uh, when you actually set out with your trio in 1969. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about tell us about how that came about. Uh, my trio uh, consisted of um, Tony Gould originally, uh, um, Derek Capel on the bass, and then Tony decided to go heavily into his classical studies, and uh, and I had Ray Martin on the bass at the time, and Ray suggested Bob Sedigreen was a good player, and I said I've heard him play, and I think he only plays that Dave Brubeck music, you know, so I I want to be, be out of that thing, and he said. He said, oh, no, he can play all sorts of things. So Bob came along to the Prospect Hill and played, and I booked him, and we've been together for 54 years. Yeah. <laughs> and the trio lasted for, in, in that form, with, uh, with you with and With Barry, yeah, yeah. For 37 years. Yeah, you bet. Which yeah. is, was actually an incredible amount of time. Yeah, it's pretty much a world record, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it really is. Um, and what was it like? What was it like to play in, in over that period of time with people that you, you, you knew instinctively what they were going to do? Or, you know. Well, it's still the same, uh, Mel. I mean, it's, Bob and I don't have to sort of think about or talk about any kind of thing anymore. It just naturally happens. Because, and that's the way it started and that's the way it's going to finish. We, you know, we'll, we'll be playing until the day we drop and, and still enjoying each other's playing. So it's yes. just... It's, Mutual admiration. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and and you still capable of surprising each other? Oh yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably it's it's part of the part of the game. Of isn't course, it? yeah, yeah. Yeah, well that that's really great. So um, that continued on until Barry died in two thousand and six. Yeah, yeah. And then um, you've been playing with a replacement uh, bass player from then. Yep. Which is Gareth? Yes, Gareth, Gareth Hill. Hill, yeah. We had uh, Michael, um, oh, his name's just escaped me, bass player for a little while, yeah. Mike Ma, yeah. yes. And then Gareth, yeah. Right, okay, so I guess, uh, So I noticed you, 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 it, it was called Impression for a while, then yeah. you went back to. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to drop the Ted Vining trio when Barry died, yeah, because it was no longer that trio, yeah. Um, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> Every time I, I booked the gig as impressions, they said, no, it's the Ted Vining trio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good. What, what's it like to be um, uh, a leader uh, as a drummer? Is it 
the same as everything. I mean, I, 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 every group I've ever played with is a cooperative. I mean, I expect input from everybody and output from everybody, and they expect it of me. So it's, it's, it's not, the leadership is only booking the gigs and paying the guys who. Yeah. <laughs> so, when you say the lead, did you, did you have any input in into the selection of tunes and things that you were playing? Oh, uh, often, yeah. often, yeah. 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 So the the leader is is still a very, a very important sort of person. Now, um, some of the the other things that you did along the way was that uh, um, you had involvement with uh, with Moomba for a while. You, you were a musical director, weren't you? Yeah. Mm. So how did that come about? It came about was it, uh, through advertising. I was with Family Circle magazine and Family Circle uh, wanted to run an article about the Moomba festival itself, yeah. So I met the guys and, and had a meeting with the general manager at the time and I said, you, you don't have any jazz in your, your festival, for God's sake, why not? And he said, well, because nobody runs it. And I said, well, I will. I said, okay, you can be the musical director. <laughs> and so I, I was for about, I think I did three festivals. Yes, yeah. yeah, so 77 to 79, I think it was. Yeah. That was the, the period of. So who did, you, who did you manage to bring out for those? Well, very fortunately, um, um, Dizzy Gillespie's quartet first, and, uh, the Count Basie Orchestra, um, Oscar Peterson and Joe Bass. Uh, pretty nice lineup here. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. And this was, of course, uh, you got funding for it as well. Yes, well, um, it was sponsored by, um, I won't name them, but it had a, a very heavy sponsorship here. Yeah. We, we got, I mean, we actually had about 25 grand to spend, which was great. You know. yeah. 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 That brought a lot of musicians in oh, those yeah. days. Yeah. 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 Good. Yes, well, that was a sort of a, a, great, a great highlight. And, um, then you were also around in the, in the 80s, you played a little bit with um, Martin Jackson. Yeah, Martin's Bob Waller, yeah. yeah. Yes, and, um, and also Bob, Bob Settergreen Blues on the Boil. That yeah, was, that occasionally was. with that. I, I did a Jimmy Witherspoon with him, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that, that, was, that was at the Limbic. Yes. Limbic in South Melbourne. Yeah. Limbic yeah. Hotel. Is yeah. that still there? It is, but they don't have any jazz. Oh, right, yeah. the, um, that was a great jazz pub for, yeah, many, for, a long time, for yeah. many, many years, uh, but um, sadly not anymore. And then um, you got involved with um, uh, Alan Lee, that you said that, that, that a very nice recording you did with um, PBS Live, mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was there, and Bernie McGann. Yeah. A great Bernie again, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so tell me, how, how did you uh, how did you get a, uh, to get Bernie to? Well, I I met Bernie um, first when he was living in Melbourne, playing with a band called the Heads when they were at the, a place called the Fat Black Pussycat, which yes. is a wonderful jazz club. Um, and uh, and that's where I met Bernie at first. Then I, when I lived, moved to Sydney for a while, yes, in my day job, um, yes. We got together and started playing. That was great. We had a quartet with Bob Gibbett and Ray Martin and Chuck Yates and yeah. Mark Bernie was just wonderful. Yeah. Yes, he was, he was terrific. So that was about um, you moved to Sydney first and then then up to Brisbane. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's good. So how long did how, did, how long did you spend in Sydney? I've lived there twice. Um, uh, the first time I was, I managed to to uh, make a recording with Burroughs called Jazz Australia, yeah, um, and a shared album, an L yeah. LP, and played with a lot of good guys there the first time. Second time, um, I lived there for I think about two and a half years until I looked at advertising adventures in Queensland and and uh, found one and took it. Yeah. Right. And that, that was sort of about about 1983. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Good. So how long were you up in uh, in Brisbane for? For uh, four years, 364 days, and 23 hours. Because another hour they'd start calling me a Queenslander. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So what was your experience of, uh, of the jazz scene up in Brisbane when you were there? Um, there wasn't one. It was just basically bad trad music, yeah, um, as far as I was concerned, or appropriated Glenn Miller and, you know, just, uh, I found some good players, which was the beaut thing. Um, I, I sorted out the kind of people that I wanted to associate with and make music with, and it became a specialised unit that everybody disliked, yeah, because we were adventurous and playing our own music. I called it Music Yoi, um, and that didn't get us any good because nobody could pronounce the name, yeah. <laughs> Where did the name come from? Um, when I was touring in, in Europe with Brian Brown, um, I took my own snare drum in a case, yeah. and we had our own roadie, and uh, um, and the the airline split the lid of the case on one of the journeys, and my, our roadie Roger um, found a sticker somewhere and stuck it on the inside of it. Right, and when I played my first gig in Brisbane when I moved there for Jazz Action, um, the bloke that wrote the, the notes on it later on said Ted Vining should call his new group in Brisbane Music Eoy because that's a sticker on his case. <laughs> and I thought, that's an intriguing name, I'll try that. So I thought, I better find out what it means. So I rang the Finnish concert, worrying that it might mean this way to the toilets. <laughs> yeah. But it means Music Proprietary Limited. Right. Yeah. Oi, oi is the property. <laughs> oi, yeah. That's <laughs> good. So, um, that, that what, what sort of style of music was that? It was, that was pretty free very style. Very yeah. contemporary, yeah, free, yeah. Yeah, free. But I mean, Peter Harper and Ian Chaplin were just great composers of music, yeah. Yeah, so, and uh, there was uh, Peter Walters too, wasn't there? Yeah, Pete, the, yeah. Bass, yeah, that's yeah. good. So, did that, did that um, um, group continue for a long period of time? Well, I got tired of, like I said, I didn't want to be called a Queenser, so I came back to Melbourne. And uh, the guys followed me down, went to the VCA, yeah. Right. yeah. So we, we stayed as a group together, yeah. Now it's called Blow, we just changed the name, yeah. Right, yeah. you thought that, that's better, people can, uh, can do it. One of the ones that I was intrigued about was that um, you got to play with Christine Sullivan. Oh yeah. My favourite singer, yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Oh, she's just a classic musician with a beautiful, pure voice and huge range, yeah. She, she, she walked up to me at the down at the Bennett's Lane one night when the trio was playing. I'd never met her. And uh, she walked up to me and she said, Oh, Ted, I'm Christine Sullivan. I said, Oh, Chris, nice to meet you, yeah. She said, I've always been frightened to come and talk to you because I, I believe you hate singers. <laughs> I said, no, not all of them, just most. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, um, and she kept, she kept singing forever, didn't she? Yeah, she did, but she, she stopped now. She lives on the Gold Coast with her, her bloke. Um, uh, she lived in the States for quite a while and was starting to do it again and start to write music. But she doesn't do it anymore because she says, I'm not good looking enough and I'm overweight. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah, no, well, <coughs> she certainly was a, oh, a, great a, singer, a, yeah. a wonderful singer. So, um, uh, I noticed that uh, the Blow had a, had a, a big gig at Bennett's Lane in about 2001, it's Peter Harper was, was that, mm. um, Avian Sheriff. Yep. Um, and then you did a, when you, when you were, had, had a thing called For Alvin. Now I presume that that was referring to your great mentor, Alvin Jones. Yes, uh, indeed, yeah. The drummer. Yep, uh, I met was, him. Yeah. Yeah, I spent some time with him in, in Finland, yeah. We had breakfast together, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so that was a trio you did with Steve uh, Magnuson. Yeah, yeah, Steve, yeah. Yeah, haven't seen Steve for a while either. Yeah. So tell me, um, what, what was special about Alvin's drumming? Uh, he was very different to every other drummer. Yeah, his, he had his own very personal style, uh, and it just attracted me because it was 
aggressive but passive, um, delicate but loud, um, every facet you could imagine in a drummer's armour Alvin had, as well as being a great musician. He plays guitar too, plays piano, yeah, and a beautiful man, yeah. All right. Yeah. So what, what bands did he play with in, 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 in the States? Well, in, mainly with the John Coltrane Quartet, yeah. yeah. That's, that's where it all happened for me, yeah. Yeah. So he was... He was one of your uh, your great stars, and yeah. you mentioned Stewie Spears, Spears yeah. the local one. Yeah. And uh, who, who else was influential in, in, your, in your drumming? Philly Joe Jones, Art Blakey, um, black drummers. Um, the guys that played with a purpose and, and, and hit the drum hard, yeah. I always enjoyed that. The guys that, you know, that, that, uh, stuck it up the horn players, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought that, uh, that, that that's what happened, but oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's good. So, did you uh, over your drumming career um, have you changed your your style, or was it? Would you just say that you just gradually modified it? It changes itself because. Strange enough, as you get older, and I, I don't think it applies to every musician or every drummer for that, but, but I find it easier now. Ideas roll off my hands or from my heart, from my brain, a lot easier than, than when I was younger. It's, there's a, a relaxation thing about it, you know, where it, it's no longer an effort to, to play a drum solo because the limbs just, you know, they, they, they do what they're capable of. Yes. yes. And that's all I want to do. Yeah. I don't want to be the fastest drummer in the world. If I did, I'd buy a sports car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's interesting. It's it's this um, this idea about um, anything to do with music is, is is a form of muscle memory, isn't it? Yes, indeed. That, yeah. that you're you're not actually thinking about what you're doing on an individual thing. It's it's in your mind and it's actually yeah, happening yeah, yeah. without you sort of thinking about it. So it sort of fits in with what you say about it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so amongst the, uh, some of your many overseas ones, um, I ran across a, a photograph that was taken with you with Walter Siskind. Oh yeah, that was at the foot, that back pussycat. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he came and listened to the Brian Brown Quartet. Yeah. It's so incredible. he was. Where did, where did, what was his claim to fame? Oh, he's a conductor and yeah, mainly a conductor. I, I don't even remember what instrument. I think, I think he might have been a pianist. But uh, loved jazz music. Yeah. Yeah. yeah from, Incredible. From, yeah. From, from the Czech Republic. Or yeah. Czechoslovakia or whatever. Yeah. Those, those, yeah whatever. So who were the who were the, who were the stars? That stand out that you um, that you played with from overseas. Oh, Dizzy, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I have a great relationship with Nat Adley. Yeah, I, I did three tours with Nat. That was wonderful. Um, George Cables, the piano player, I loved him. Uh, um, uh, I worked with uh, Joachim Kuhn, who was the fastest piano player in the world. Yeah, from Germany. Um, uh, Oh, uh, Clifford Jordan, a tenor player, yeah. Record, uh, uh, I recently got sent a recording of the concert we did with Clifford Jordan, yeah. I didn't even know it existed, yeah. Um, uh, there's a number, I, yeah, I just can't remember them all now, but I've, they've all been highlights of my life, yeah. Yes, there's people like, um, I know it's a couple of others, Ornette Coleman? I didn't play with him, I heard him, yeah. I went to his concert, yeah. Right, and uh, what about Brubeck? Did you ever play with uh, him? Once, yeah, he played a song on the Cool Cat Show. Yeah. He came in as a guest yeah, to be interviewed, so we, I think we played Take Five or something. Yeah. <laughs> with all the, the, the drums there. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, you certainly um, have managed to fit. I've been in uh, uh, recording wise, I had a look there, and um, there's at least a dozen LPs. Yes. And uh, there's four of your trio, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, some of the more recent ones that you did was uh, 
we've done with some with Tony Gould. Mm -hmm. Yep. So tell us about if he he come back as he went off and yeah his, yeah. Uh, well, we did a a concert uh, for I don't know which place, but it, there was a concert at Chapel off Chapel I did with the Alan Lee Quartet. I've got. Alan on the vibraphone, Tony Gould on the piano, and got Derek Capel back on the bass. So it's one of the original Alan Lee quartets to play that music we did back there. At the end of the concert, there was still about 10 minutes to go or so, and Tony and I played a duet of just improvised music, and the crowd went bananas over it, right? So we decided, I thought, we better do something about this. So I talked to the ABC and they recorded the first album, which is called Forever, which we dedicated to past musicians, yeah. And then we did one with a wonderful Adelaide bass player, um, um, a name will come to me soon. Um, uh, uh, I brought him over from Adelaide because I thought he fit perfectly with Tony. And we did a lovely album with him too, so. Was, it, that, was that the one that started two pinos, was it? Yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how did you dream well, that name well, up? <laughs> The, I had, uh, it was two pinots, two... Two pails. Two, that's right, uh, that's right. Tony and and uh, the bass player had the pinots. I had the pails with the recording engineer and it took two hours to do. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a uh, so CD that I'm going to have to chase up with. Uh, with Move Records. Yes, yeah. For the, yeah with it's a good album, actually. Yeah. And um, what about your involvement with the Chris Chris Young Quartet? Yeah. Chris is still about, I think. I haven't heard from him lately, but um, again, wildly experimental. Yeah. Uh, he plays very good bass clarinet, which you know, uh, not too many people like to listen to it, because it's but, but I love the sound of it. It's great. Yeah. And he writes his own compositions, which are pretty crazy. Yeah. But that was with the Tom Fryer, the guitar player, who's a great player, um, with Nick Haywood on the bass, yeah. Uh, um, uh, um, and yes, experimental music, yeah. Good, fun, fun music, yeah. But you wouldn't get too many gigs, though, you know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not ever going to get much played on the ABC. No, no. You don't think that. And, um, uh, I know that you were you were honoured in uh, 2017 with uh, induction into the Hall of Fame yeah, of the Bell. Yeah, really Wars. nice. Yeah, really nice. Mm. So what had it? What sort of ceremony did you have for that? They have uh, a function at um, what's the what's the guy's name? The guitar player that has, runs that jazz club in town. Um, it's called Bir Birds. Birds Basement. Yeah. At his, at his restaurant yes. venue, yeah. Um, they have a big occasion to present the awards for the year, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I got one, yeah. Bobby got it the final year, the year after, yeah. Yeah, so well, that was a, a special uh, one to have that to be acknowledged by everybody. Yeah, it's quite yeah. nice, yeah. yeah. So recently, uh, I know that you, you know, since you uh, relocated down to Tasmania, which you've been for a few uh, few years now. Um, what's what's the jazz scene like been down in Tasmania? Um, the jazz scene is what you do yourself, because there isn't really one. Yeah, um, there's still a smattering of, of traditional music, um, uh, and the, they still run a, what they call a jazz course at the at the um, uh, conservatorium, but it's it doesn't seem to be turning out any great talent that that plays anywhere anyway, you know. And if they do, it's some obscure milk bar somewhere or some kind of bar or whatever. But there's, there's that, that's the problem. There's nowhere to play. Yeah. Yes. So, did you do anything about that? Oh yeah, yeah. I started running things myself. Um, and I started employing interstate musicians. Very fortunately, I had the backing of the um, arts, uh, um, the Salamanca Arts Centre, um, who paid the bills, um, and I just booked the talent and and run a month, ran a monthly concert for two years, uh, bringing interstate 
top people, um, and also ran two festivals here at the end of the year, November, a four-day festival here. Yeah. Is that still going? No. no. The, the monthly they're trying to keep on, they've changed the name from Jazzamanka yeah. to Salamanka. Yeah. Yeah. So, or rather, Because there's, no, yeah. there's no jazz in it. <laughs> One thing that I was interested in exploring with you, Ted, is what, 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 what's your view about the future of jazz in Australia? I wish I had one, Mel. Yeah. Uh, jazz is a different word to to the young people of today. It's, um, I actually I, I watched something on YouTube yesterday, and it was Dizzy Gillespie's All Star Group with Monk and all those guys, K Winding, the, the ones that toured here. And I looked at it from a perspective of a, of a young kid um, who's been told to look at jazz or listen to jazz. And I thought, I can see why they're not interested, because it's, it's, they don't understand why these guys love doing what they're doing to begin with, um, and how dedicated they are to it. They don't understand the, the background of all that, grooming to become as great as they were. Um, uh, all they hear now is half decent music, you know, that, and, and they don't want to aspire to be a Dizzy Gillespie or an Art Blakey or a Thelonious Monk. But, you know, they'd probably rather be a, a, a Taylor Swift or whatever her name is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, do you think there's a lot of, of what's termed jazz in a lot of the contemporary music? It's, it's more improvised music than necessarily jazz, do you think? They're one and the same to me. Improvised music is jazz music, yeah, to me. Um, um, the more improvised, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I can understand why people can't grasp it, because it, if it doesn't have a theme that they can walk away whistling, um, unfortunately they, they don't accept it or like it. Yeah. That's what, you know, it, the people that, that have made good, like Dave Brubeck, like Take Five, people used to walk out of those concerts whistling Take Five, you know, and it, it popularised the, the, the jazz at the time, which was wonderful for the idiom, but um, it didn't go any further, you know, so yeah. people stopped at Take Five, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, is it because uh, the, 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 the whole way the music has evolved these days. I take it from what you said about that you're not a great fan of the, of, of what's called popping music these no, days anyway. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. So where where is it deficient? It doesn't it doesn't Oh well it just doesn't it just doesn't mean anything to me here. Yeah. It's, it's you know, I, if I want to hear words, I want to hear nice words, not swear words, you know, yeah. on in songs and and hate and you know, all that and killing and all that nastiness. Yeah. Yes. Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there, um, when, you, when you look back on the sort of the, the Frank Johnsons and those, the earlier years, is there a, a distinctive Australian sound in jazz? Uh, well, there I'd, was. I'd was like it? to say yes, but I, it's all derivative from American black music, you know. It's, I hear black music in lots of players. Brownie used to, Brian Brown, used to talk about you know the Australian sound. He didn't want to be an American musician. He wanted to be an Australian musician, have an Australian sound. I won't say what he used to say to him, but but uh, <laughs> we disagreed. <laughs> yes. So, do you think in another, if we fast forward through another fifty years, do you think there's people are still going to be uh, experimenting along the way? I think that, yeah, while, while, while guys are proficient with their instruments and things, and, and like we said before, the, the schools are teaching them to, to be masters of musical instruments, not necessarily as improvisers, but they can play the goodness out of their instruments. Everybody these days, not, not everybody, but most kids that have got talent. Um, so, God knows where it's going to go, you know, yeah. It'll just be on there with them because you had some involvement in teaching yourself, didn't yes, you? Yes, yeah, yeah. So wh where was that? 
College of the Arts here and the Conservatorium in Brisbane. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that was was that a part time thing? That oh you yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 So how do you how do you get to, to teach somebody to to, to drums? You listen to, listen to them. Well, I I they're still around. They they you know the the ones that want me to to talk to me about teaching. I was, I see them sitting they're sitting in their seat gradually moving it further forward all the time until they eventually come and say, um, uh, do you teach Ted? And I say, no. They say, oh, I, th I was just wondering if I'd like some, you know, any chance I'd get a few lessons. And I say, what do you want to know about? And they say, I want to know how about how to play like you. And I said, well, you've got 60 years to spare? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and uh, you know, I, 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 I'll, my teaching method is very different to everybody else's. I'll talk to you a lot. And I'll play you a lot of music on the on the machine, and you'll listen to it, and I'll point things out to you. And and furthermore, I'm very expensive. That and I don't get the call. <laughs> yeah. um, I remember I came across a quote when I was looking up there that um, asked um, about your your playing style, and uh, the quote that came from from. Um, Bob Seneca, I think it was, said, no one can, can come up to Ted's approach to jazz and time playing. He demonstrates so much warmth and feeling in his approach to jazz percussion. And he said, although in some ways not a modern player, Ted plays orthodox style drums, he's an extremely strong, solid pulse player. Mm -hmm. Now, could you translate that into <laughs> English? <laughs> Well, it's the most important part of a drummer's armour is his time. If he doesn't have good jazz time, go and play commercial music. You, know. you can't teach people jazz time. They've got to be born with it. Yeah. So that means being right on the beat or, or waving off the beat? Wherever, it's there, there is a time. Your, your time is your heartbeat, right? So right. Really. And, and, and it, if you've got that time, giving people lessons, well, if they've got that time, giving people lessons, it's just to, to sophisticate it, um, improve it a little bit, um, teach them some dynamics that they didn't have in their armour, that's all. Yeah. All right, but if, if, the, if they haven't got that time, yeah, forget then it. you can forget it. Yeah, yeah go and drive a cab. Yeah. I used to say that when I write reports at the College of the Arts until I got pulled up. I'd say, um, he doesn't have a future in music, he should be driving a cab. And they said, Ted, you can't say <laughs> things like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All reports have got to be shades of, uh, of moderation, don't they? Yes. Yeah, my, one of my best pupils is a kid that you probably know, Danny Fisher, yes. the drummer here. Danny, I, my report to, uh, about him, at the, he finished, so I said, Danny could play anywhere. He's a He's a fine drummer, right across the board. He's got great time, great sense of dynamics, the great thing, but he desperately needs a, trans, a, a personality transplant. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you can't say that to you. <laughs> That's really good. So uh, I think, um, the le well, what's the legacy that you think that you've left in your, in your career in, in, in drumming? You know, what, what do you feel most proud about? Uh, that I've never wavered. I've, I've never turned commercial. I never wanted to make a living at music uh, because I didn't like to have to play what people wanted to hear. Yeah. I always explored the explorable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And always pushing. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Pushing, pushing. Yeah, hopefully, you just gain a couple of listeners, you know. Great. Two people come up and ask you a question? Lovely. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Cats who want to stretch. Yes. I think that's, that was one of the expressions that I, that, I, that I picked up. It's just been a wonderful experience to have, uh, to have talked to you. We've covered most of the, the sort of the, the things that I wanted to talk to you about. Is there anything else that I, that I might have missed that you think I we ought to put in? I don't think so, Mel. Well, yeah, we've pretty well covered it. It's a, it's a, um, the beautiful thing is, it's, it's, it's an, I'm 86, but it's, it's an ongoing story. I'm not going to stop playing until I've 
fall backwards off the stool and die on the stage. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've been blessed, very fortunately, with only having to play with great musicians. Yes, well, I think that that's a, um, a, a wonderful note to end, end on. And so thank you, everybody, for, uh, for watching this. And Ted, it's been a real pleasure, and thanks for making the time. Uh, Ted's come over here for uh, uh, a 50th uh, concert yeah, with, with Bob, with Bob, Bob Sedigreen, Sedigreen, yeah, Bob yeah. Sedigreen tomorrow yeah. night um, from Tasmania. And uh, so it's a great honour to have you out at the museum here and recording this little bit for history. So thanks a million, Ted. My pleasure, Well, thank you.